Give me a nod when you're ready. Shooter's ready. Stand by. Welcome to this episode of Bullets and Bourbon. I'm joined by my co-host, Frank Gao. And today we have returning guest and friend of the show, Colonel Gregory Jones. Colonel Jones has been instrumental in the decision-making, leadership, and direction of all things marksmanship within the Marine Corps as the commanding officer of Weapons Training Battalion. But today, July 26th, Colonel Jones not only relinquishes command of Weapons Training Battalion, but retires from the Marine Corps. It's not often you run across a man that makes such a profound impact on all things you love, and it's even rarer to be able to call that person a friend. But Colonel Jones has been extraordinary in his guidance and direction in the past two years that I've known him. Colonel Jones, uh, before we get started, is there anything you'd like to say? No, I appreciate that. Again, I certainly appreciate the friendship between you and Frank and, and the work that you've done with us and the shooting team to help get the word out on what we're doing. And I do appreciate um, all the nice comments. But again, when, whenever I like to talk about weapons training battalion, I like to remember, pe- remind people that there was a large body of work that started before me, and there's a large body of work that will continue after me. And that's the nice thing. It can be a frustrating thing, but it's a nice thing about the battalion. The service change takes a while, um, but again, right, the right colonels in a row. Um, Colonel Cuomo is certainly one of them. Taking over for me allows <clears throat> really the baton to be handed from. At least in the more recent era, Colonel Hall, re- who got you know the the, um, the the results of the combat base lethality assessment, did the ARQ, started IMT, to Colonel Mark Liston, who finished ARQ, got a lot of work done on IMT, and then over to me, who really we will talk about it in with one of questions, who is <clears throat> getting funding for JMAP that goes with infantry marksmanship training, although we didn't quite win on that this year, but also. Um, trying to or now we've got a lot of folks excited about change to include the depots and organizing that at the three star level and uh, hopefully a, a marksmanship modernization campaign plan that will be signed by the three star here in, here in a couple of months but right <clears throat> and then Colonel Cuomo will continue to do that and uh, get those things done but then also start to continue to broaden the aperture with other projects with our O and R Office of Naval Research starting to um, look at ver- we already have some good um, virtual marksmanship trainers, but really start to branch out into virtual marksmanship trainers um, and, and, and try to better understand uh, the correlation between virtual marksmanship training and live fire marksmanship training, which again, going back in my day with the ISMIT, it was just go use the ISMIT sort of because we bought it and it saved bullets, but nobody told me what to do. And even now with some of our higher end systems, uh, I don't know if we're telling sergeants and lieutenants what to go do in these systems, right? So they're having the system is important, but if you don't know how to utilize it, again, to increase your hit factor, short bay, long bay, whatever, then you're just going in there and you're doing whatever program the contractor puts in and it's not purposeful. So I appreciate the um, <clears throat> the kind words, but again, a lot of work done before me uh, and a lot of work done after me. And most of the greatest work in Weapons Training Battalion comes from uh, the best shooters in the Marine Corps on the shooting teams, infantry marksmanship cadre, uh, and, and really all the NCOs and staff NCOs on the battalion. No, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, in this episode is going to be a little bit different because like, I think this is an opportunity for you to, uh, you know, talk to Marines as a whole on not just your career, but things that have impacted you and things, you know, things that have helped you along the way and things that you have observed that could potentially help other people. So to kind of get it all started, um, can you give it some advice to individuals at these particular points in their Marine Corps career? So we got a newly promoted NCO, a newly promoted staff NCO, and a fresh lieutenant to the fleet. Yeah, those are good questions. And certainly, I think seminal points in the young Marine's career is, you know, you get to be a major or gunny, we start, we, we sort of expect you to know 
how to how to you know become you know move from gunny to first sergeant or company commander to battalion operations officer because you've been around for over a decade or more um but yeah so like newly promoted nco when i was company commander alpha one seven that used to be one of my <clears throat> favorite discussions i used to have a you know stump speech down i don't remember it all word for word but um you know at the end of promotion uh and we would always separate out <clears throat> uh corporals you know it might just be like P, you know, PFC through Lance Corporal get promoted. Then, you know, they march to the rear and then we had NCOs come out, but we always wanted to separate it, um, <clears throat> make it separate and distinct. And then usually I would, I would just talk about the fact that like, even though you might've gone to boot camp together, you know, I'll just use some infantry, um, use my background as an infantry Marine. You might, you might've gone to ITB together. You're probably, you might've been in the same platoon or company together, but um, you know, we, we, we we recognize individual competence with promotions and when you get promoted to nco you are literally this non-commissioned officer in the chain of command and and we would talk about like hey it's not bob or john anymore it's corporal so and so especially in, when you're in front of junior marines that might not have gone to boot camp itb or on a deployment with you but but again you have i always wanted to impress on ncos especially uh going to combat that they are part of the chain of command and that other Marines should um, should heed their orders as as if they came from myself, the company commander. And I really tried to uh, um, uplift, make being an NCO special, and at least at my level, separate them out from their maybe their peers by time and service, but but not rank. Um, and again, that that's that can be really hard to do. Um, especially when you, you have a cohort of Marines that, you know, that, that went through all that entry level training together. But, but if you want the rank of NCO to mean something, <clears throat> the chain of command has to make sure that folks in the unit understand that it means something to the commander, but then to that newly promoted NCO, they have to make it mean something like, again, and I'm not talking about blood strike. I'm not talking about weird hazing stuff, but as professional as you can, you, you have to make it, you have to make it mean something. And that takes discipline because maybe, maybe you just can't be friends with, with some of the Marines um, that you used to be friends with in, in the same way. Right. Because now you, you know, if you're not going to cover for them anymore, if they're, if they're out drinking late, not ready for PT. Right. Cause you're, you're you know, that starts to be difficult when you're part of the chain of command, um, but definitely newly promoted NCO chain of command needs to support it, but you got to act like, a newly a newly promoted NCO and carry yourself as such. Um, newly promoted staff NCO. That's a good question too. I think this this really could go for any rank where you officer enlisted um, when you start to to command the unit through others, right? So again, just using my infantry background, if I'm a brand new staff sergeant, I might have been a really really good squad leader, uh, and they definitely should know how to run a squad better or set comm section or whatever um better than that sergeant but if you do their job for them then that that's micromanagement and it's a break of trust so you gotta again like ronald reagan said trust but verify don't let them fail but don't do it for them because you probably because now you're not just in charge of 12 other marines you're in charge of 40 marines and three different squads and you have different responsibilities to the organization then micromanaging <clears throat> subordinate subordinate leaders, um, and then always lieutenants fresh to the fleet. I would even say, you know, captain or staff and CO fresh back to the MOS after being on recruiting duty or the drill field. Like you got to you you have to trust, right? And there's maturity that needs to happen both way ways. You know, the, the staff and COs have to respect the fact that that the lieutenant is responsible expected to be and will be held accountable by the other officers in the battalion to be in charge of everything the unit does and fails to do <clears throat> again but we're not talking about making you know the lieutenant king shit on turd island right the lieutenant also has to be mature enough to understand that that like he your MOS school, TDS, IOC, OCS they're good schools you are prepared well you don't need to be nervous um act act as you know command the unit but um but you also got to trust right don't don't assume that you know more than everybody else don't you know you util utilize your 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 subordinates ask questions i always 
in the trust, but verify it, you got to be savvy about it. I used to just like to say, even, even now with certain marksmanship things as a Colonel, I don't know what that is. And the Sergeant knows better than I do. So it's easy to just as, as a new person in charge, just ask someone like, Hey, I'm not, I don't know a lot about that. Can you show me, can you teach me, help me understand what you're doing and how important your job is so I can be a better leader at Marines are Marines are not going to think um, that that is weakness. They don't expect their officers, especially the Lieutenant to know machine guns and machine gun gunnery better than a Lieutenant. They will disrespect you. If you act like you, you know, the job better than them, they will respect you if you're interested in what they do and listen to them. Not all of the time, but enough that, that, that they understand you appre- that you appreciate the things that they have to say. Does that does that make sense? Did I answer the mark there? No, you did. Yeah, I got a quick follow up. Um, so what I've noticed about you is that you spend a fair amount of time uh, training on sat. You know, there are some weeks where I would show up once a week and you'd always be there. And in the back of my head, I was like, well, I hope he doesn't think that I am here literally every single day of the week. Um, but I mean, you 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 there's a lot of officers and I think senior staff and CEOs out there who uh, wouldn't necessarily put themselves in that position to shoot amongst like the best shooters in the Marine Corps. Um, but I mean, is that an important part of leadership for you to still show like a certain willingness to get out there and like learn from others and at least like do the thing that your Marines are doing? Absolutely. As a company commander in Iraq, uh, I mean, I, you can't ask a Marine to give their lives if you're not willing to walk a mile in their shoes. I, I mean, I don't do it all the time, but when I had headquarters battalion, second Mardiv, I put on, I put on, I went down to the, to, uh, the motor pool, um, and truck company. And I put on, I put on coveralls and I spent a couple of hours learning how to change the tire, a tire on a, on, on, on a seven ton. And it's actually really difficult. It's not like changing a tire on your car. There's all types of seals. And I mean, that thing's so heavy, it'll break your leg. Um, same thing with, you know, um, <clears throat> comm company, you gotta, when I had headquarters battalion, second word, you gotta be down there. Uh, it might be boring and you might not understand it, but like it, you gotta start to understand because, because you're helping bridge the, like you're helping bridge the gap. Right. And so I would need to understand at least, um, enough of about what they did so in the g3 or the cg was like greg i don't really know why we need all this extra stuff like sir do you want data comms yes i do well, if you want data comms the only thing that we have in the marine corps there, there's more than things but in the division you got a, a vsat it's a satellite terminal and that but greg it's hard to camouflage yes sir i know that but but you know so you, you have to again i don't know how i have to know how, how to do a communicator's job but i have to understand how it interplays so I can best meet the commander's intent. And you're not going to do that uh, from your office. You, you're just, you're just not. Um, and again, that's, a, and everyone always says like, don't command the organization from behind your computer. But now I'm in, I've had, I've had commanded two companies and RS and three battalions. I'm about to have my 12th change of command. And out of 27 years, I got 10 and a half years commanded company above. And what I see is between, Fit reps on MOL, awards in DTS, um, separations through command legal authority. Um, I mean, I'm supposed to do stuff on GCSS. They're, the service is creating systems for efficiency, but then they want the commander with like JPEZ. You can only delegate that to one person in a, in a battalion size organization. So I look at my sergeant major, I'm like, if I, like, I want the Marines to have someone paying attention to their JPEZ score, but I don't know I need to be the one that does it. So I delegated it to Sergeant Major, right? Um, yeah, so so you, you just got to balance it. You don't want to not be on those systems, um, but you you do have to, you have to get out of your office. And, and then again, walking a mile in their shoes. I, yeah, you just have, especially when the conditions are miserable and unfortunate, um, you, you have to be out there. Uh, one, it helps you trust with verify. But it, like I said before, if you do it in a way that is, is a little savvy and and people don't know that you're out there checking on them, you're just out there spending time, they generally are glad to see you, especially if it's not micromanagement and especially if you're not out there 
all the time. As far as from a marksmanship perspective, um, I none of I don't think anybody expects me to be better than them. And I joke with people that if I am, then there's a problem. Probably huh? look a little bit harder for members to be on the shooting team, right? So, um, but again, that's the the whole interplay. Like at OCS, Ducktix example, lead by example. We expect you to lead from the front, but from a technical perspective, I mean officers are not generally technicians maybe pilots are but infantry officers are i'm not a mortarman i'm not a machine gunner i'm not a sniper i'm supposed to understand how all of them interplay to locate close with destroy the enemy by fire close combat right i'm the sort of the orchestrator of those things not necessarily the doer but if you look at a a, a, a you know an orchestra someone that um, a conductor for uh, an orchestra that person understands maybe can't play every um, instrument, but they understand the effects that the drums or the cymbals or the tuba or the trumpet are supposed to provide. They understand how to read music, right? And then conduct the orchestra to play in a fashion that the, that the song is is appealing, right? So that's sort of what I think, even as a platoon commander, as a lieutenant, that's some of what your job is. So that's, that's what you just got to be out. And if you don't like being out with the Marines, you probably should find another job. Agreed. Honestly. Yep. Yeah, totally agree with that. Like, if you're not having fun, if you don't enjoy, like, I'll 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 say this. I had a platoon commander. I'm not going to name names. Um, he, you know, we were we were drinking in a bar one night, and you know, him and I got along fine on a on a personal level. Professionally, we were okay. But he told me he's like. I'm in love with the institution, but I can't stand the Marines. He's like, everybody in our fucking platoon is weird. And I, I, I think every Marine should have a college degree and you shouldn't be allowed in the Marine Corps unless you have a college degree. And it's just like, really? Like that, that's how you're going to leave this off at? Like you love the institution, but hate the Marines. Like, yeah. you, and, and he no, ended I mean, up, that, that, he ended up odd. getting out. He, he ended up getting yeah. out of the Marine Corps, you know, and I, and I straight up asked him, I was like, so did you just join the Marine Corps to prop up your future business career and whatever you do? And he was like, absolutely. I was just like, makes total sense. And you know what? More power to him. If that's how he wants to be, that's how he's going to be. Um, at least he's in a better place now. And, you know, he did his service and you, yeah. you can't hate on somebody for doing no. their service. Um no you know, and thank you for your service, but it's just that approach that he took that, you know, institutionally, he was in love with the institution and everything it stood for, but yeah. he hated the Marines and that's, that's a travesty. And no, I you, agree. yeah, no, but I agree. I mean, my perspective is that like the Marines are the organization. When I first got, and I will tell you when I first got in the Marine Corps, I, w I was a little underwhelmed and not just, and I'm not picking on a list of Marines, as officers to staff and COs, I was a little underwhelmed from what I, again, like when you're, I went to the Citadel, looking at my MOI, the AMOI, the AMOI, it's like, he's a 40 year old gunny. The guy, he, some of this, he may have done for show. He'd sit there, drink coffee and smoke cigarettes before he did a boots and utes run. He'd start, and I'm in pretty decent shape as a 20 something year old. He'd start out after all the, the little cadets let, started the run and then he'd pass most of us right and then the professor of naval science at the citadel a guy named john basil had like a, a bronze star was v from vietnam for defense he was an artillery officer for defending his fire base with hand grenades in a 45 so i'm around like and and then a lot of meseps too i'm around giants um and i get to the marine corps and you're like mm, that landscape was a little fat like oh my peer lieutenant is like he's not you know, there, and then, um, and then you get a job or two that you don't, that you don't really like. And you start, I think, blaming, blaming the Marine Corps. But for me, I had to get over it. Cause I was like, well, the Marine Corps is a human organization and most of the humans are doing what they're supposed to do and are way ahead. Um, you, you know, from a standards based ethics based posi position, then, you know, then I, I haven't really had a civilian job because I got commission when I was 22, but I've had, I've done enough stuff now that compared to the other services, the institution, which is the standards, the, the, the mottos, you know, every Marine rifleman, honor, courage, commitment. It's, it's the, the human beings that live out the ethos, the history the traditions and, and make the organization. 
uh, there's certain regulations I don't. I mean, no, I don't know anyone in the Marine Corps that likes to get a haircut every week and shave, but we do it. And I, we and I'm more disciplined now than I was a company grade officer. Some of it is because like I don't want to be seen in Hampstead, North Carolina, was chief staff of the division when half the division that worked at Courthouse Bay lived down there, and I wanted to uphold the standard and lead by example. There are standards that people don't like. But, but I also don't think if the Marine Corps had, did not have standards that we would appreciate the Marine Corps as much as we do. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's interesting. But, I mean, the, the institution in my mind is the people and the people working to uphold our standards. And, and that's why I think being a Marine is so special is because we're willing because we're a very standards based organization. So I have a I have a really good friend that's um he he is in third special forces group and you know he he looks at things from a standard space type deal and you know one thing he told me he's like you know what dude he's like I envy you in many cases like in in the way the Marine Corps does it because the Marine Corps does it right like you guys you guys uphold your standards and hold people accountable and and, and follow the rules and regulations unlike big army and he's like you yep. guys still got it like where a lot of other people don't. And I, I never thought of it in those terms. And like, yep. we don't see what we don't see. Like we are very, um, we're Marine in the Marine Corps. you you have a lot of tunnel vision as to what you are doing in the here and now. And you don't ever really look outward And the Marine Corps. Doesn't really do a whole lot of things joint uh, realistically. Yep. Um, a lot of like GWAT, when we're out there, Al Ambar, that was our AO. Yep. You know, we had Army roll through, but realistically, we were handling everything on our own. We were upholding, you know, the traditions and standards of the Marine Corps and the way we fight, and we did it extraordinarily. Um, but the Marine Corps as a whole does not look outward to the other services, so we don't see how they really realistically conduct themselves, Like, except, like, if you're on a MEW. And and we don't need to get into that and like how yeah. how you look at the Navy, um, you know. But there's but they're more of a technical organization compared to what yeah. we are. Definitely. But uh, yeah. you know, what would you say are some characteristics of the best officer and staff and SEAL working relationships that you've had during your time in the Marine Corps? Um, that's a good that's a good question. Um, I I, I would generally say pr like a professional friendship. Um, like Sergeant Major Borders and I, uh, Sergeant Major Gwaltney and I at Headquarters Battalion, Sergeant Major Ken Bone and I at ITB, uh, retired First Sergeant Jason Burold and I at Alpha 1-7. Um, really a professional friendship, but but professional friendship takes maturity. And I don't mean like professional friendship, like we're college roommates and we're out on the town drinking together and looking for girls, right? I mean, professional friend. I mean, like, I do work and family, right? I do the Marine Corps and family, have some hobbies, hunting, fishing, right? But like when, when I'm done with work, I'm generally at home. I'm not hanging out with my platoon sergeant or my first sergeant. So I don't mean they're like professional friendship, like they're your best friend. I mean, you interact with each other professionally with mutual respect. And when it's the best, you, you enjoy being around each other via a professional friendship but it is but again it takes maturity where again uh that the, the the staff and co understands that you do carry the mantle of command that you are responsible accountable for everything the unit does and fails to do but then as the officer you respect generally up you know till about colonel or really battalion commander definitely colonel your your st staff and co counterpart first sergeant counterpart is significantly older than you and more experienced. Um, so I think the higher you go, the easier it, the easier it is because you're similar in rank. You got a lot more experience. <laughs> um, but yeah, the officer needs to respect the experience that the staff and CO has. And if the staff and CO says we shouldn't do it, then you might want to think twice about it. But again, and as long as everyone follows what I learned was really the the best way. Argue 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 like hell. Uh, when the door is closed and so the Marines don't see really like mom and dad. And this goes the same way, XOCO, company gunny CO, you know, 
battalion commander, battalion ops chief, right? Those in senior leader positions, you do need to tell, you do have an obligation to let the CEO know that he's a king with no clothes on, but it needs to be done in private. And then when the boss says, no, we're, I've made a decision, when the door opens, everybody in the organization should execute the orders like they gave them themselves, right? Especially oh, yeah. if the order is legal and ethical, right? We're going to, you know, we're going to go this is our route and we're going to checkpoint one to five. And, you know, the battalion gunner was really concerned that if we went through checkpoint five, we'd hit an IED and wanted to go to checkpoint three to then checkpoint six and not through five. Right. That That's not the kind of stuff that, that you, you make a big deal out of and talk shit. Uh, you should never talk shit um, about the, the boss's decision uh, in front of the Marines. That's, you know, so again, just a, a mature professional friendship. Respect goes both ways. Um, yeah, and that, that's easier said than done, though, right? Because sometimes oh, yeah. you're partnered with someone like you had just mentioned that you don't, you're not. He's like, yeah, that's not the great. And again, I've I've had a sergeant major that I uh, was horrible, um, and he was because everyone in the unit also thought he was horrible. I've worked for colonels that I would never talk to outside of work if I didn't happen. But anyway, go back to like the Marine Corps is a human organization and not everybody's perfect. So then your leadership challenge is to figure out how to work through that work sometimes around or with that person, but do so in a way that, you know, is not disrespectful to the person's rank or position and doesn't get you into trouble. Or sometimes I think in the Marine Corps too, is we get so worked up about like who's right and the right way to do business. Sometimes we probably just need to chill out especially when you're not like when I was a, after being a RSCO, I went overseas on a joint assignment as an EXO and I worked for an army Lieutenant Colonel Fayo. And it was really, really hard for me to realize that like, I'm not responsible or accountable for anything the unit does or fails to do. So if I advise the Colonel to do something, he's like, I don't want to do it that way, but it's like stylistic and he's not doing anything legal illegal or unethical and okay if he pisses the cg off i don't like i told him but i'm gonna go home and hang out with my kids and i'm not gonna carry that stress and that mantle of command so i probably straight off topic a little bit but um yeah mature just maturity and on honor each other's roles i guess and and support support each other's roles yeah one of the things i learned like as a platoon sergeant for instance like with with another platoon commander I had, like him and I had a great relationship and like from the get go, like one thing I believe in as a staff and CO when I was when I was a staff sergeant, even as a gunny, it's like, hey, sir, I'm going to give you a counseling sheet as well. Uh, here's my initial counseling to you. And this is this is so you know where I'm coming from. And this is what I expect to you. And one of the things is, is we are a team like we are we need to approach our platoon as a team. Um, because at the end of the day, when we give an order to these Marines, it shouldn't be coming from you or me. It should be coming from both of us. And whether yeah. we agree with it or not, like we are that team and they don't need to know that it, it, there's some deviation or, or disagreement. They just need to know, hey, this is what we need you to do. And yeah. that's what really builds some of the best relationships out there. I agree. Actually, very similarly, um, First Sergeant Major ever on recruit on recruiting duty just was not good. Second Sergeant Major was great. But one of the things that I learned to do over time, and again, I I haven't done it as a colonel because you you just get to the point where you you've both done this so many times where you've been a battalion commander before and the Sergeant Major's been in a squadron or um um or battalion. battalion that you don't need to do it. But I think I think it might have been Ken Bone is at at ITB is I realized I just. I, and some of the reason that the relationship probably wasn't as good as I was, uh, again, he sucked, but I also didn't really, cause I didn't know what to do with the Sergeant major. And I expected him to know what to do. Cause he was a Sergeant major. I didn't give him any expectations. So then from there, I was sort of fighting an uphill battle cause I never gave any expectations and I never started the conversation. So I get Ken bone. He's been a battalion Sergeant major a couple of times. He's like, Hey, look, I said, Hey, look, I know you've done this a couple of times, but like I've learned, that it's better if I, I'm not going to give you a billet description counseling. That's, you are way too senior for that. 
I'm going to give you a letter from me to you that outlines my expectations of a sergeant major. He's like, sir, that's great. I appreciate it because I too have learned that I need to like inform the battalion commander of what my role is based on my ideas, experience, but also the MOS manual, Mm -hmm. right? Like this is my job. And I was like, oh, wow. And it was really the same thing that you just mentioned is we spent enough time to think about what we wanted out of the other person. And then we sat down and used those documents um, to guide the discussion. We sent, you know, we was like, okay, well, that's great. I sent him mine. He sent him his on email. We read them and we sat down and talked about, and again, that was one of the best relationships I had um, with, with the Sergeant Major, um, especially when I was sort of a brand new battalion commander. And he, I mean, he was on, I think I might've been the second, second or third CO. Um, but yeah, it worked out well. And like you had said, whether it's written down or not, there should be a give and take and there should be a discussion on how you expect to run the unit as a collective command team. Absolutely. So, you know, moving further along, um, what particular duty stations and deployments or relationships do you consider pivotal within uh, who you are today? Mm, and I, I, I know like your, your role in like Vietnam and everything you did out there was pretty, pretty amazing. And we covered that on a previous uh, discussion in a podcast. Um, but are, have there been other things that have really made you who you are today? Um, yeah, so I don't, that's sort of a complicated question. I mean, I think I, I sort of, when I look back at my time in the Marine Corps, I, I feel, you know, when you get in when you're 18 or 22, I mean, I, you, and you, I'm almost 50 by the time I get out. I, I've i grown up in the Marine Corps and I had NC, I worked for General Neller one time when I was a lieutenant, headquarters company commander. I went from being a boat company commander, assault element leader right? That's, uh, that is a perfect lieutenant job to be in a headquarters company commander at a regiment. I was not ready for any of that. And one point in time, I sort of passed off an NJP, the commo wanted to burn a sergeant for being late, like a couple of times, but it's like five minutes late. And I could tell he was out to get him. And um, I was just like, well, I mean, a major, a major wants to take this kid to NJP. I don't want to, I don't think you should be NJP. I'll, I have an idea. I'll just refer the NJP to the regimental commander. I'm not thinking like my role as a commander is to make a decision. I'm knowledgeable that I'm not even selected for captain yet. And I got a major giving me crap. So I figured, well, the right answer is to just send him to NJP with a regimental commander. And basically Afterwards, I think I can't remember what General Neller did. He might have just downgraded to a sixty-one hundred five. Then he he kicked everyone out. Looked at the major. I'm like, really? You guys can't work this out. Then he kicked the major out. I'm a lieutenant. I'm like, think I am feeling sorry for myself that I shouldn't even be in this position because I'm only a lieutenant. And he and he called me a chicken shit. He called me a chicken shit. He called me a coward for not making a decision and standing up to the major wasting his time and then he explained to me what the difference was that he could do in njp at the 05 or 06 level 45 and 45 one half one month's pay for two months all the stuff that i didn't know and i was like oh my goodness he's like did you want me to do that i was like no sir i really wanted this to go away well you should have told the major right you should have just made a decision quit being a chicken shit that that cut me to the bone um, cause, cause he basically called me a coward. Um, and I didn't perceive the situation, but do you ever think that I served up a crap sandwich decision to a boss again? Hell no, never again. I, I still remember that to this, to this day. Um, so there's a lot of instances like that where you sort of grow up in the Marine Corps. Um, I think a lot of my time, my first deployments, you know, in Iraq from 2004 to 2008 as an S3 alpha company commander, an opso for one seven. Um, that's, that sort of was the hook that set me wanting to stay in the Marine Corps just because of the, I mean, there's obviously unfortunate times, horribly unfortunate times with Marines that get killed or seriously injured, but just that's what I expected the Marine Corps to be is that camaraderie, everybody pulling on the rope in the same direction, working really hard to achieve, to achieve a mission, bring everybody home, kill bad guys. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, those were some big ones. And then 
And then recruiting duty was being an RCO was semi horrible. But again, if you want the unit to do well, you really, you, you really have to set, set some standards and maintain standards. And some of the Marines didn't, some of the Marines didn't, didn't make it to a, to their recruit ribbon. Um, and that, that sort of sucks when you have to end a Marine's career. But, but again, we're a standards based organization. And if you're not going to, if you're not going to, um, if you're not going to meet your obligations in the, in the contract that you sign, your enlistment contract literally is a legal and binding document between you and the United States Marine Corps. If you're not going to adhere to that and you're not as serious about it as the Marine Corps expects you to be, well, then you can go find another job. No, I think that was perfectly said. Um, so what, what would you consider the most difficult or trying point of your career and how did you overcome it and how did it change you as a Marine, a leader and a person? And then to finish it off, what advice would you give someone going through something similar? Um, I honestly, I mean, I, I, I want to, I, you know, you, you reflected on your career. Honestly, you want to sound something cool. Like when I was a company career in combat, um, that, I'd like to say that, and that was a great deployment. Had a lot of great Marines. Um, I think sometimes combat's not not easy, but sometimes I think it is easier to get motivated to do hard things be, because you, you don't want to die, and you don't want your Marines to die, and so you're just really serious. And I mean, it, it, it's it's six or seven months long, eight months long if you get extended. It's not like for me, recruiting duty was three, 36 months long, 36 um, mission letters. I took over RS Cleveland. We were number 23 at 24 in ERR. And at one point I called one of my buddies and I was like, did the when the general looks at the ranking sheet, do they see 23 or 24? rs cleveland do they just see greg jones sucks and they're like yes get get over it get over yourself nobody cares that you have a bronze star nobody cares that you have a combat action ribbon like what have you done for me lately and we're getting tired of covering for your nasty rs and writing contracts and shipping them because your marines can't and i was like this is you i felt like i was starting all over and i don't know anything about the job and we suck right so like there i am 12 years of my career, relatively successful. I take over a crappy organization. I don't even know the business model and I'm starting and I'm a loser, right? I'm literally a loser. Um, and that was, yeah, that, that was hard. I, I didn't, you know, and you got to find the one or two people. I had a great recruiter instructor. Again, I said my sergeant major wasn't the greatest. I had two captains um, that didn't know anything about recruiting duty, but they're malleable and they're going to do what you say. I found some really good staff in CICs. Um, we laid out a vision. We talked to other people with best practices. We got serious about making Marines. We had a 25% MCRD attrition rate. When I first got there two years later, we were number one of 24 in ER, and we had a 2.2% attrition rate. And as, as goes the unit performance, so goes accolades for Marines. And it, we won a bunch of meritorious promotions um, but because we were good. Uh, we were a recognized commodity. And like we could say in every meritorious promotion, staff and CIC, you know, recruiter in RSS Akron wrote two band members and, you know, got an NRTC scholarship and all their Marines graduated from brute camp seminal to RS Cleveland's rise from 23, uh, 24 to one to 24. And it meant something. Um, 8412s. If you wanted to be a 412 in Cleveland, you pretty much became an 8412 because our the way we did business was correct. You easily had the numbers to be an 8412 because the system uh, that we put in place. Um, and, and you know, so again, success breeds uh, success. But that is that was a really really long time. Um, again, at one point in time, I think the ERCG. I had like nine Marines in my first 18 months that had been at, at, at Scepter Court Marshaled. Uh, and the CG wanted to know why I had so many disciplinary problems. And, I, and they want to come down and talk to you in person. You're like, I didn't even know I had separated nine Marines. Like, why did this happen? Uh, and people, 
people challenge you, you know, and then sometimes when you're making Marines work hard and you're making them do business the right way, oh, that's why the way why we had some Marines that got into trouble because they weren't, they were frauding Marines in and being dishonest. Um, you, you know, people start personally attacking you. My wife stopped being involved in, um, in, in family readiness stuff then because I had a great idea to do a, a, a unit Facebook page and she got attacked by some spouses because I'm, I'm, you know, I was making them do their job. You get some IG complaints against you. Um, and you, and you also have, if you're going to hold people to accountable with the level of kicking them out of the Marine Corps, cause they're over height and weight standards or they can't pass the PFT, but sir, I write three contracts a month. But like, yeah, yeah, but the standard is a standard. Then you better darn well be able to meet the standard yourself because wh why wouldn't someone shit on you and tell on you? Cause that's hypocrisy and that's not what we expect out of Marine leaders. So, um, that, that was just difficult because it was a long time. Um, it was a long time to go from bad to good and then sustaining it is almost, is almost as hard. Yeah. So anyway, that was, yeah. And, and I, and on top of it all, I didn't want to go on recruiting duty either. I did not want to do that. So well, anyway, are, that was, you also had an area of like, you know, you and I remember 325 Lima company from oh, Iraq yeah. in 05. And like, yep. you know, when you were there, that, I mean, that was still fresh in the minds and the hearts of the people of Columbus, yep. Ohio. And, Yep. That is not something that's easy to overcome. Like those people resented the Marine Corps and yeah. we were, so we were not allowed in, into some high schools. We bumped into one of the Marines. I think one of the Marines that was killed in the sniper, basically Taliban video or not Taliban Al Qaeda in Iraq videotaped themselves walking up to snipers. They weren't, they were snipers, but the battalion shouldn't have just dropped them off in the daylight and let them sit on the ground. I mean, it mm. was a sniper position at first and then that turned into a bunch of Marines laying on the ground out in the open. But uh, yeah, but they, they've, they all been back to, they've been to that position three or four times. Yep. And like that, yep. I, I mean, I, somebody I work with, he, he was in that battalion, uh, not for that deployment, but like he was one of the COs there prior to that deployment before he came over here to Virginia. And, you know, I do know that that battalion commander got relieved after that whole deployment just yep. because of everything that happened and the yep. decisions he made. And, you know, when you tell a sniper platoon or a sniper team, I, you're going back to that same spot three or yeah. four times, bad things are going to happen. Yeah. That if you do do that, it becomes, a, it becomes a defensive position. You need to be dug in. Mm -hmm. right? um, but yeah, we ran into one of those, I'm going to forget the name and I wouldn't say it on the podcast anyway, just out of respect for the family, but we ran into one of those Marine sisters and she was all excited about talking to the Marine Corps recruiter. I'm sure she respected her brother, et cetera. And then I heard about it just because they told me because this name was sort of famous in the area for Marine that gave the ultimate sacrifice. And then about a week later, the, the Marines were like, she, her parents called us and asked us never to talk to her daughter again. And you just move on. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it, yeah, that was, yeah. And it's Rust Belt recruiting and yeah. It, it, it was just, it, again, this is a long, a long, difficult time where you, you're all, I mean, you're basically, it's, it, you're basically operational for about three years. Um, it, Cause you have, you know, you got to make mission every month and every day someone's paying attention to, to all of your, your sales actions. And it can, it can be a lot. It get, it actually got easier though, as, as we sort of fixed ourselves and fixed our procedures and got some of the right leaders in place. My last year actually wasn't that bad um, just because I wasn't, I wasn't worried about missing shipping and getting fired every other month. Right. And having, and missing shipping and calling the district commander and saying like, Hey, sir, um, like I miss shipping. He's like, I already heard about it. You can miss shipping once and then hung up on me. That was like my first six months. And again, I never, I was never really had to really worry about getting fired. I had to worry about getting killed, but you know, that starts to be a different dynamic when you got, three kids at this point, you got to call your wife. I'm like, I don't think we should have bought a house because I actually might get fired because I do not see how we're going to be successful because I did not in my first six to eight months, I did not think that we were going to be successful. I did not know how to solve the problem, but that's where you go. Like we, we went back to some of the earlier questions about like NCO and officer involvement. Well, sometimes you got to trust 
and you got to have a personal relationship with your staff and CEOs and be like, guys, we got to dig ourselves out of the hole. What are your ideas? And then, again, that's the man of the command. You got to pick sometimes the best ideas, but then you also have to rally the Marines around you to get them to get them to work towards um, success. But again, like Frank said, sure, you go out shooting a lot. Yeah, I was in my blues a lot. I was at high schools a lot. I was shaking hands a lot. I was at class talks a lot. I was TAD a lot. I was on ride alongs a lot. I mean, you got to be out there. And when you start, whether it's combat or recruiting, you're out there with the Marines a lot and you show them that what they're doing is important. And you got to talk a little bit of shit too. I, 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 I would, um, I mean, I tell the Marines like, you know, have you, I was like, I'd say who, who has, who has a drill instructor that's a friend, right? Cause everybody thinks that DIs are the greatest and they are right. And then people raise their hands of like, you should call them and say, you're welcome and hang up on them. <laughs> right. And, and then start it like, Hey man, Hey dog, what's up? Like, no, you're welcome. Cause you got a job because of me and then hang up on them again. Right. <laughs> you, you, but you, you got to get them excited about what they're doing because they're like, Oh, I got to go to high schools and this sucks. And high school kids are telling me that they don't, you know, they're disrespecting me. Like, no, be proud of yourself. I used to, again, I, you're on the front lines of the Marine Corps. You're representing the Marine Corps in, in your high school every day. The commandant of the Marine Corps, the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, is never coming to your hometown, never coming to that location. The, the only way that, that these people, that America knows what the Marine Corps is about is because of you. That's it. So be proud of what you're doing. You're an envoy of the core. And again, is that, but you got to believe it too. You got to believe it because, because the Marines will see through that. And so, you know, but you just gotta, you just gotta find ways to motivate people and get them to rise to the occasion. Um, and, and again, I think, you know, getting someone to go out and do a raid, coordinate search, clear some buildings, that's not necessarily easy and if you got to do that for five six seven months in a row it gets it gets harder and harder and ho- harder especially when you got a couple of close calls you start realizing you had a couple of close calls so i'm not saying that recruiting is easier than combat by any means but th- three years is a, is a really long time to be in a really hard job yeah i don't think i've heard anyone recap their time with recruiting and just tell me it was a complete breeze uh, almost yeah. everyone has had to deal with adversity the work hours and honestly dealing with a uh very uh i guess unreliable and unpredictable population which is yeah. high school kids right because i mean yep. you, you probably had a lot of uh prospects fall through and you had a lot oh, of other you. things yeah a lot of things happened last minute um so you mentioned early on, you know, you grew up in the Marine Corps. It's basically, you know, if you join, most of us join around 18, 19, it's the preponderance of our adult lives. And, you know, I think something that I've enjoyed being friends with Matt is seeing him really blaze a path in this post Marine Corps life. So you've been very successful in your Marine Corps career, and you're going to continue to have success uh, as you transition into the civilian world. But have you had a second to kind of you know, look at what you've accomplished in the Marine Corps and then kind of, you know, assess how that's going to transition into success in the civilian uh, part of your life. Um, yeah, I think yes and no. I mean, I guess I answer the second part of the question first. I, I, I'm at a point I'm not I don't start terminal till like September. I got PTAD and stuff like that. So I like I'm not no, I'm not going to get you. You can't work legally until you're on terminal and then a lot of business especially if i'm doing government contracting there's ethic rules and stuff like that and like these big companies they're not gonna what i've learned is they're not usually going to give you um a job offer till you're close to being off a terminal anyway it just puts a couple of months between you and the marine corps especially if you come back and like if i do training stuff um with a government contractor and i'm back in tecom even if i'm doing you know, something that's not related to marksmanship. I was still in 06 commander and under the TECOM umbrella. Um, but so I can't guarantee that I'm going to be successful, but I will tell you is I don't, my, my, you know, looking, starting to look for jobs, doing informational interviews, networking. I, I am not worried about getting a job. Um, I just had a buddy who talked to a buddy that said, Hey, do you know any retiring colonels? Cause I want to hire them. And I, and I think that goes for senior enlisted too. I, I think we're very marketable. Um, yeah, I, I was, I had a American corporate partners. They, you can do a mentorship with somebody. And I was like, 
they were like, who do you want to be your mentor? I was like, someone is, is far away uh, from who I am. And I, I got a, a guy that I think had been in the Navy for a little while. And, um, but he runs, he runs like the hospital side of Mass General Hospital. Like oh, wow. that's a, yeah. And, and so, um, and he was a great guy and he sort of explained it to me. He's like, anybody can get an MBA, like the importance of what, what the military service brings is uh, anybody can get an MBA, but, but not everybody's going to be able to lead in, in, you know, large organizations under significant duress, especially in combat, like you do in the military. And those, those employers that understand a little bit about that um, appreciate it. I think the other portions of your question, looking back and um, what did you achieve? I think um, people that are come to your retirement, I, I've been over, we'll see, you know, there's always people that RSVP and then can't come. I've been guilty of doing that. You say you want to show up when you got like a bunch of stuff that day and you, you don't show up. But I mean, I, my, I had company gunnies coming. One of my lieutenants is coming. I lost track of my company XO, but one of my lieutenants found his number and tried to get him to come. I got, you know, NCOs coming from Arizona and Texas. I've got, you know, guys on LinkedIn or Facebook. I've had two of my Lance Corporals DM me and like, hey, we talked to our section leader. Can we come to your retirement? We would be honored to come to your retirement. I'm like, I'm a product of South Carolina public education system, <laughs> high school through college. Like, I don't think that I'm special, but some, but but it's it, it it's a couple of things. A lot of folks are coming. But I also do think that they appreciated my leadership. So that that obviously makes you feel like your time in the Corps was worthwhile. A uh, couple sergeants major that I've known, a couple of colonels I've known. Uh, one of my first NCOs in the Marine Corps is a platoon commander. Now he's in Quantico, he's in Quantico Stafford area, um, but I've kept in touch with him for 26 years. He's coming. Um, yeah. Uh, and those, honestly, there's some general officers that I've worked for that are coming. Um, and, and that's important because I respect the hell out of them as great leaders. But honestly, it means it means more to me to have my company gunny uh, in Iraq fly from Arizona to come to see me, uh, especially I haven't seen them since probably about 2007 than it does some of those some of those generals. And it doesn't mean that I don't appreciate the generals, but um, I just have a relationship, one of those really, really good professional friendship relationships uh, with them. I, I think some other things, and especially combat vets um, from Iraq and Afghanistan might resonate with this. Um, you know, we, we were told that we were going to create democracies there, and that did not happen. Um, Afghanistan is, uh, historically, it's going to be a strategic failure. It, it, it is. That's what history is going to say, uh, much like Vietnam. And I don't say that to to discredit the sacrifices that Marines and service members, um, uh, 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 you know, they pay the ultimate sacrifice. I'm not meaning to be disrespectful. That's just factual. We got out of Iraq, ISIS came in, now we're back there. Um, so, so like for me, for a while, I was confused about what we were doing and what I accomplished. And then I went, again, I went three deployments to Iraq in a row from 2000, I was in Iraq every year from 2004 to 2008 for at least a couple of months out of the year. I go to command staff, collect my thoughts a little bit, and then I'm on recruiting duty. And my wife is the friendly one in the family. And she's, we have, we're not anywhere near, we're in Medina, Ohio. We're not near any military bases. And she's got a bunch of mom and dad friends from like kitty football. And I would get invited to these things. I felt really awkward and really distant. I did not know what to talk to them about. And I started to realize, I started to get really bitter and I didn't want to do anything with them because I was pissed that they didn't know anything about uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq. They didn't know anything about the history. I mean, they knew 9-11 happened, but they didn't know anything about any of this. And I was like, what does it take for them to pay attention? Like if we let all of the shitheads out of Abu Ghraib or Gitmo and let them run around Cleveland, Ohio or Medina, Ohio with AK-47s, is that going to like, is that going to make them appreciate uh, the sacrifices that I paid and Marines paid. And then finally it dawned on me that like, that that was really sort of obtuse thinking. And it dawned on me that I just needed, I, I started to realize that 
I don't want them to be ignorant of the military. They were pro-military. I want, I would have liked them to be a little bit more worldly and paid attention to the news. But I realized I was getting frustrated with the very freedoms that I helped protect. Right. And again, I don't want them to be ignorant of what we were doing a little bit more informed, but like they didn't have to worry. They lived a nice life. And, and then we are, we are in a service industry. And so when people say, thank you for your service, I sometimes feel guilty, but I've tried not to feel guilty because, you know, so I, uh, recruiting duty started to put a lot of that um, to perspective. And at the end of the day, we might not have made them a democracy, but knock on wood, we haven't had another 9-11. And, and we did put a lot of bad guys down over there, so we didn't have to do it over here. And for me, um, that makes time spent away, um, blood, sweat, and tears, literally. Thankfully, you know, God bless, I don't have a purple heart. I got all my fingers and my toes. Um, but especially for the Marines that paid the ultimate sacrifice, that's what makes me feel better, is we haven't had another 9-11 you know, I don't, I'm not on Sipper TS a lot anymore. And I wouldn't say it if I was, but I'm also not aware, paying attention to the news that like we have some significant other attacks imminent. And and that way, I think if, if you know, if you were a Lance Corporal and did four years or you're a colonel like me retiring at 27, um, we held the wolves at bay. And that that's democracies in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's a pipe dream. That's, um, that's uh, what's the opposite of real? You you just got your master's. The op- opposite worldview of realism, uh, fantasy. No, well, oh. liberalism. Like oh, okay. Anyway, that that thing. Um, okay. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. the realist. You know, that's that's sort of the UN's going to solve world problems and democracy. You know, I, I I'm fine with democracies, but that again, I think that was a fantasy, like you said. Uh, but from a realist perspective, uh, you know keeping the wolves at bay and letting Marines live the American dream um, makes me uh, feel very good about my service. And I hope it makes other people feel good about their service because there's too much, there's too much anxiety and or frustration and animosity. And it, it drives me crazy when I see Marines, you know, MRF and the Marine Corps, right? Don't lose faith, faith with America. Don't lose faith with the service. America and the Marine Corps have have been a successful brand um, with with successful values for a long, long time. Yeah, I thought that was incredibly well said. Thank you for sharing those thoughts with us. Uh, This next question, I asked Matt a variation of it after he uh, retired. We'll call it the sweet and sour question. So can you go into an instance in your career where being diplomatic achieved the best results and perhaps contrast that with another one where being aggressive yielded the best effort? And then do you consider those two, the ability to be both uh, a balance, to so to speak, as an important facet of leadership in the Marine Corps? Yes. Answer the last question first. Yes. I'll just use one deployment. I think is the same, the same example um, in Afghanistan, uh, Task Force Southwest 2018. We got out of Afghanistan started to fall of shit we have to go back right um and try to prevent the taliban from you know retaking terrain from the islamic republic of afghanistan um in that environment um it was it absolutely was a joint and combined environment i didn't do a whole lot with the uh, ana and anp the advisors did it the advisors would bring me a plan and then i'd support it well supporting it meant i needed to get a lot of a lot of isr a lot of casts, um, and in a joint environment, and we also wanted to do shaping operations, um, and we had an ODA with one partner platoon, but it just, we could do, there's a lot more in that environment that you can do, especially with three-letter agencies, a lot of Air Force assets, and so really following General Watson's lead, we just really made friends with a lot, with a lot of people to include, um, you know, we would do the target package uh, the Intel target package for the local ODA. We worked with the Air Force to dev out, develop out targets uh, in northern in northern Helmand. And we got a certain number of assets that we would dev targets out from like Lashkarga up to, I think, Sangin. And then the Air Force would dev out targets from Sangin to Gajaki. And then they had a certain target set that they were interested in, um, that their general wanted them to basically 
um, I think it was called counter finance, counter finance. So they were taking out a lot of narcotics labs. We, if we developed one of those targets, we'd pass it to them. If they developed more, you know, basically human targets, we were, we were going after Taliban leadership. They would pass that to us. And then we started to create a volume of targets that we couldn't, that we couldn't, we needed to come up with a better way, uh, a, a service in those targets. So then we got, you know, I just called up to Lieutenant Colonel Opso at NSOC Alpha, the SOCOM element there was like, hey, look, what if you, and again, there's a lot, all of this is diplomatic because this is, this is like the art of doing business in a joint environment because none of these people have to work with work with us, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to be diplomatic. You have to sort of explain to them that we're better together. Um, and we, and, you know, we talked again with NSOC. I don't, my CG didn't own any of their risk. Their CG did. But if we work together, like I'm going to develop out all these target packages. I've already talked to the ODA down here. Their higher headquarters AOB is fine. What we need you to do is we need you to pitch, help us pitch this con op so then you can get rotary wing assault support so we can do multiple halves, helo raids uh, in the north for for disruption ops at the same time. And then then we'll have our own drones. So you're doing your missions here. We'll have our own drones and then we'll start, we'll continue to hit uh, like structures or any uh, human targets on the periphery. And then you just create sort of momentum and some tactical uh, pressure through, through um, kinetic fires. Uh, and, then, and then again, working IO, PSYOP type of non-kinetic pressures uh, or, or effects, excuse me, that continue to, to create pressure on them. So that, that, those were ways. Uh, and we, we got to the point that um, I think one of the two stars, two star COs, uh, really, the, the NSOC, he said something like, nobody kills more Taliban and Hellman than, uh, than Task Force Southwest. And that, that sounds odd, but the, but the NSOC guys could go all around the Sejoa, and it was really a nod, his nod to us, that we were really good at what we're doing. And then much like recruiting duty, when you start to get really good at what you're doing, especially in the killing business, everyone else is interested. And then we, we had... Resolu- the four stars start asking us like how can you do more of this can you do some of this in the italian zao because they don't have the same authorities and permissions um i had my my arrow uh f-16 pilot going out to western afghanistan he told me he was gonna do it and i was like yeah man do it um basically pre-worked it out pull him off uh the jtar going out west for about 15 minutes to hit a strike first thing in the morning and then he's got enough gas to to continue mission right people will you're not allowed to do that we got a little bit of crap for it but um but people will do that for you because they believe in what you're doing and that and you will have success right so uh also though on that um on that environment is the opso i i call it going opso mode where sometimes you just got to crush people um and then an environment where everyone has a lot of stuff going on um, sometimes the brief for the general gets complicated to be given because they got other, they have things going on also for the general. So I really had to be sort of a jackass to the point that I had a Colonel pull me in like, Greg, we really appreciate uh, everything that you do. The task force is better because of you, but you're going to be a Colonel someday and you can't yell at people like that. So I was, so I was aggressive to the point of probably being a little, not probably of being a little too much and being way too heavy handed and sort of knife handed and yelling at people. Um, but at the, but at the end of the day, like if it, it's got to get done, you got to go opso mode or beast mode or whatever you want to call it. And sometimes, sometimes somebody in the units got, let's just like drill instructor team. Somebody's going to be the heavy, somebody's got to be the disciplinarian. Someone, someone's got to keep people on task because if you don't do that, then you're not an organization, right? You, you, and you're not synchronized and integrated. You're not an organization. You're just a group of people that are doing things. And a group of people that are doing things are not going to be very successful at accomplishing the mission. And they're not going to be very successful at helping the commander or the commanding general achieve their intent. Yeah, no, very well. I, I really resonated with what you said about being opso mode. Um, 
yeah, opsos are very task driven. Usually it's something like things come up that have to be done at, in a particular way at a particular time. And you need somebody like you need a Tim Hitchak, you know, behind yeah. the scenes, basically like telling sure. people like, no, you need to do that right now. So very important muscle to flex if you're going to have any kind of longevity in the Marine Corps. I absolutely agree. Um, you spoke a little bit about some hobbies, right? So we know you like to shoot. Uh, you said hunting and fishing. How important are personal hobbies towards, you know, balancing uh, between that and your, uh, I guess, your professional your professional endeavors while you're in the Marine Corps, how important was it to carve out time for both of those things? Um, I think it's huge. It's hugely important. Now, I mean, I had, you know, when I say I grew up in the Marine Corps, I grew up in the Marine Corps. I mean, I was that Lieutenant um, with got my wife got pregnant before we went on the first deployment, my first deployment, she had a kid. But by the time I was a company commander going to Iraq, I had like a, a four-year-old and a two-year-old. Right. Um, so initially I didn't, you always have to make time, uh, to PT. You always have to, um, and as a company commander, platoon commander and a captain at OCS, it was sort of easy because your, your PT is generally programmed in with the unit. And, um, and so it's not hard to stay in shape. And in those jobs, you're on your feet all the time. You're hiking, you're out in the field. Um, but you know, when I was on staff job as an opso or on recruiting duty one of the things i need i that i learned is i as i um is as i basically had to get up early enough i always thought these old marines were crazy for getting up at like five o'clock in the morning but like i decided especially on recruiting duty that i was going to get something done for myself mm -hmm. every day mm -hmm. and then start my day feeling positive with a sense of accomplishment that I worked out and took care of myself because as soon as people show up to work, I don't, you know, the magic time in the Marine Corps seems to be zero eight, you know, if, if you're not in the field or something um, like but it's zero eight when people start moving. And again, if you want to be a good leader, if you want to have an open door policy uh, and you got a staff and CEO that wants to talk to you at, at, at 1900 when you're about to leave, but then you have a really important, impactful talk for 30 minutes till 1930 like at least that it doesn't screw up your PT time. Right. Um, again, as my kids started to leave the house, that's where so, some hobbies became more important because I, I needed to, to keep myself busy, but yeah, yeah, you have to do that. Um, and I've gone through th this duty station and I've been very open about this had sort of been a little hard, not in, but in a different way, because I came off of five years in a row, uh, in second Marine division finishes the, the G3 and the chief of staff, with a 10 month deployment in Afghanistan and web training battalion is very important. It's just, it's not as dynamic as the FMF and we're dealing with service change. So it just takes a longer time to get things done or convince multiple generals or both weapons field training battalion COs and CGs at the depots, both SOI COs, the CO at TBS, all the colonels are involved in entry level marksmanship to do with that. We should do a thing and then experiment with it. So I'm, you know, and my family didn't come up here. And usually when I come off of, you know, three deployments in four years to Iraq or Afghanistan or 10 month deployment after a long work up to Afghanistan, I'm able to sort of recenter and balance myself by, by, by reinvesting time in myself, PT, uh, my family and my faith and geo batching here. I didn't have my family, although I'm only five hours away, I'm not complaining. And I just have a hard time going to church by myself. So that put me in a little in a little bit of a funk where hobbies became more important because the worst thing in the world that you can do is, is, um, my, is basically seek relief or joy through gambling, pornography, alcohol. I'm not saying I was doing all of those or any of those, but well, I mean, I was probably drinking a little bit too much and it's just not, it's just not healthy. Right. Um, right. so you got to have healthy outlets, um, you just have to have healthy out outlets. And especially as you go through chapters of life, um, sometimes with young kids, you're so busy, you don't, you don't even have time to sleep, right? And so you get programmed where you're so busy at work and you're so busy at home that when some of those types of things start changing, you literally in a different phase or chapter of life. And you got to be, I think, prescient enough, I won't say smart enough, you have to be self-aware enough, mindful enough that you then too have to, you know, continue to learn, continue to grow and, and fi find other ways to be productive or you're going to find the end of Netflix. Right. And that's not necessarily health healthy either. 
um, cause you're just sitting on your, your behind watching television. So mm-hmm. uh, I, I don't know, hopefully that answered your question. No, it does. And, you know, I think, uh, I, I what you said that resonated with me was the whole, uh, you know, getting up at zero five. Um, yeah. and it's the only time you can really guarantee to yourself, you know, I think, uh, for a lot of Marines, they can count on Chow to PT, yeah. but you know, as we get more senior, you, you are working through Chow. Uh, you are staying later oh, than everyone else. Absolutely. And, and if you, if you don't carve out that time for yourself, yeah, then, you know, the rest of your day is more or less dictated, uh, by things you have to do or by other people. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I became the more Marine Corps forced me as it became more senior to become a morning person. Yeah. So I really resonate with that. Yeah. And I think the other thing, too, and I wish I would have found this out earlier, um, you know, again, because some of this, the Marine Corps, if you let it, the Marine Corps will find a way to screw up just about everything. Right. Like I love reading. But again, uh, the commandant's reading list again, I and I appreciate that. But at some point, um, you know, what are you reading? Why are you reading it? And are you having fun? reading right and um i'm trying to look into my library so i don't bone up some names of some books i really so again uh, reading is great but sometimes reading stuff off the commandant's reading list is uh is cumbersome Mm -hmm. um but just a couple of books that i read that were really fiction that i really that i really liked 2030 uh a novel uh yeah, 2034, a novel of the next world war. That was written by Admiral Stavridis. It's almost like the companion to Ghost Fleet. That was ah. to- that was fiction, but it's science fiction written by a guy who's not who's not, you know, a dummy and is pretty well informed. That was fun. Re- I'd never read um I hadn't I'd never read 1984, right? Mm. That's a classic fiction. I wrote, I read that. I read Slaughterhouse Five. I read Catch Twenty Two. I, I just, I, at one point in my time, it, and I didn't stop reading PME books. I actually did those books on tape, but I just reading had and PME had become, had become almost a chore, right. and it wasn't as fun anymore. And I was like, well, you know, I'm not. A, I'm a. I have bachelor of science in biology, so I don't. So those are not things that I necessarily came across and i was just like hey what about um what about famous english works of fiction just to sort of round me out um and to ha- you know to have better or different things uh to talk to talk about or think about and then dive into call sign chaos that was a good book dive back into you know um some maybe or even even you know books that might be on like the sergeant pme list i don't know if 40 Thieves on Saipan discussion of some of the first snipers in World War II. I don't know where that is, but that was that was a tack, especially for this job. That's a or when we had Scout Sniper Instructor School, that's an easy read. It's an autobiography, but and it it talks a lot about just bravery and camaraderie of Marines slash snipers at the platoon level. So I think I, I needed I needed to break up some of my reading regimen into into different types of reading um so i'm still staying mentally stimulated but it didn't become a chore yeah i that that also uh that's something that i can definitely uh relate to uh after getting through my master's program reading as yeah. many as three academic books a week yes it, yeah absolutely becomes a chore and you yeah. are forcing yourself in many instances it's 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 more common to force yourself through a book that you're not really interested in but you yeah. have to get through for a discussion yeah. or for a paper than to uh, read something that you truly enjoy so yeah. i think that's important uh matt and i you know early on when we started this podcast uh, we had like an hour long discussion about you know Paradise Lost, and before yeah. we started recording, he he's about to get a tattoo based on Paradise Lost. Another um, one, and, yeah, an, an, another one. Um, but yeah, I mean the classics are classics for a reason, and yeah. it's, it's important to diversify the things that yeah. you're reading. If all you're reading is PME or academic books, then yeah, reading is absolutely going to lose its flavor. Um, yeah, yeah la- last question for you, uh, and want to bring this back to Marine Corps marksmanship. Um, but what do you think the future of Marine Corps marksmanship holds more specifically? Um, you know, you, you've accomplished a lot during your tenure, but what do you think needs to happen organizationally, culturally uh, for us to take the next step? Yeah, that's a really good question. And earlier in the week, we spent during our status of command time uh, brief with uh, the new CG training command. That's really actually what we talked about. Um, 
so it's like it starts to be a change management thing right and how do you and a lot of the stuff that that's that's happened especially with infantry marksmanship training program we've talked about it for joint marksmanship automated um yeah jmap joint marksmanship automated program um r- really like how do you cement those things in well the easy answer is we need money and we need general and you get money by general officer advocacy but i think it also goes a little bit further than just things weapons training battalion has done is we need a little bit more of purpose and scope like like teammates and assault are all great programs they're game changers gunfighter gym and and robotic moving targets uh jame those are paid for jmap is a game changer because it really Doc, it, it really it tied with IMT and, and is the those the the training package, and and the and the software designed to record um, your lethality factor, your hit factor, or objectively record an individual's lethality with their service rifle, which we've not been able to do before. Nobody has in DoD, FBI, etc. Um, those need those need to be to be paid for. Those two systems together, the training program and the data, they represent. Um, the application of human performance science onto marksmanship, which is not again has not has not been done for the Marine Corps. So we got all this whiz bang stuff, and a lot of it was done through different initiatives. So the biggest thing that we need to do, um, and it's supported by General IAMS, it's mentioned in Unclass uh, post CMS Mar admin. So I'm not spilling the beans or taking taking uh, something you know pressurizing. Commanding General's decision space. We're staffing this concur- concurrent with TCOM, but we need a marksmanship modernization campaign plan for the service, right? Because with every one of these whiz bang four letter acronym programs, there's hundreds of millions of dollars out there. But what are what's the end state for all of them other than making Marines better marksmen? How do they fit together? Like just looking at the infantry marksmanship assessment, I'll just I won't go into each drill, but they're basically long bay and short bay. When I when if I'm a sergeant squad leader and I go into one of these virtual trainers, what do I tell the contractor to pull up? For what purpose? To make me better? How? How do you make me more lethal? And so we the Marine Corps has done a great push to get all this technology, but I, no, we can't answer the question. I'm the guy that runs the CMS every year, right? I got to, we have a connection to O&R and we can't necessarily understand those questions. Um, and then if you start backtracking to why did we get these things, the CBA, right? The Combat Based Lethality Assessment is one, right? And like moving targets does address uh, the, what the CBA said is we can't hit movers. Look at look at the, the, the ART, there are no movers, right? So there's some purposeful things that have gotten done but but again, if we're going to spend a couple hundred million bucks and we're doing all these nuanced things across the breadth and depth of training systems and training programs, then I think three star headquarters, i.e. TCOM, needs to finish this marksmanship campaign plan. There's a forcing function to make the different portions of TECOM across entry level um, sphere better and more integrated. But also, if we want to see these things reach uh, fruition like the infantry marksmanship assessment in the FMF, then we need a TNR task approved. JMAP needs to get funded and pushed out to infantry battalions and regiments. Um, and again, most of the work is done. We just need three-star signature. We, as General Iams told us, we, you know, we need to get more three-star advocacy, not just him, um, if we want to get money in the palm, um, which didn't happen this year. He, he advocated for it, but for other reasons that I, I won't disclose. Uh, some money was went went elsewhere, um, but again, that's you know, DoD has a lot of money. The Marine Corps has a lot of money, but we never have enough money for all the things that we want. So we have to compete, um, and so that's really in a nutshell. Get the marksmanship campaign plan signed. Get some of these TNRs, mover, IMA, precision marksmanship approved, and then really package together a plan worthy of uh, three star headquarters to help. Uh, now, General Watson, soon to be General Watson and his staff, manage this uh, very effectively and efficiently at the at the service level. That's the biggest thing that we need to do instead of what has seemed to have been 
again, great products that we got, but sort of a rush to a new hot technology, right? But how does it, how does the technology fit together? And then back to weapons training battalion, at some point, we should have a training circle or a pamphlet that tells Marines when to go, when, when and how to use these different various simulated systems and, and how that should in, in, enhance their performance on a live fire range. And Matt, you'll know this, but like how many times, especially as a weapons guy, were you told to use the ISMIT? Hmm. Huh. Huh. Too many. What did they enough. tell you? To, what did they tell you to do? Nothing. The, you you didn't get like okay. there was really the, there yes. was really wasn't any yep. guidance for hey, the go, audience. Go do the go go into the Smith and go snap yep. in for, and, for and, the and, audience. And Matt, we did not we did not talk about that question ahead of time, did we? No. Yes, but but I know because Matt was a grunt for twenty years. I've been a grunt for twenty seven years. We had the same. It was like go use it. It's good. You save bullets. And and there would be an instructor in there, you know, one of the coaches, and he'd be fucking off standing standing yeah. and shooting at a simulated target that was supposed to represent 500 meters and, and hitting it. Like, yeah. what are you, why, why are we doing this? Like, why, why can't right. you do this properly and show people how to utilize this system yeah. properly? And, and, and not to take a dig at contractors running the ISMIT, but hire people who understand marksmanship and how this can properly affect training yep. within the marine yep. corps like get people who understand marksmanship at its core and hire them to be the trainers to run the ismit yes but again i will tell you like what what the marine corps what we still need to do and we are working on this with office of naval research um we are we are talking to vendors really it's it's there's a couple of dod uh departments that are working with us so it keeps my hands Colonel Cuomo's hands clean of getting all this this vendor equipment, um, uh, right, and, and and making sure that there's no uh, that we have help doing bailment agreements and everything like that, and, and we're 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 up and up on the legal, but we are getting through these other DoD entities the best and most recent virtual reality trainers yes. to then have teams IMT Marines vet them for the for the best. The, the the best interface from a gaming marksmanship perspective and then to actually test them right like and again the hard thing with teams is everybody's so good but they also know like their weaknesses i'm a pistol guy a rifle guy so if a, if you're a pistol guy uh or we can also like we've done before is potentially take students uh in a mat status from like fort Meade or fort greg adams that's how we developed the tnr the tnr task is we basically took novice marines we gave them two different ways um, a mathematical way and a swag way with a SCO and an RCO to figure out lead to hit, to hit a mover. And, and like literally through, you know, 30 students over a couple of days, the, the literally the, the most lethal TNR uh, way, way to do that was what made it uh, into the TNR task. So there's a couple of different ways that we can do that, but we want to be able to, to show um, through data that X doing X, Y, or Z in a virtual environment translates to uh, a live fire environment. So let's just say we would run an infantry marksmanship assessment on novice students. Then we'd have them do similar drills in VR for a couple of days or a couple of hours. And then they'd go out and take a post test. And if their hit factor increased and it increased across, you know, 30 students, then we'd go like, okay, well, there's some merit to this. From what I know and O&R, the guys that we work with in o I, they, they don't believe that we've done anything like that for any of the systems that we bought. Again, I'm not poo-pooing on any of the systems that we bought because they are, they are good, but then this helps us better understand, again, systems that we may want to procure in the future, but also how to better use the systems w that we currently have. So that those are the, and then a marksmanship campaign plan that helps us elevate, you know, whether it's new technology or training programs to the three-star level. So he's not, just buying a thing that somebody said we should get. Um, again, it lets the battalion be the battalion, the service proponent for all aspects of uh, small arms marksmanship training, and lets the the best marksmen in, in the Marine Corps continue to have uh, outsized impact. So that's generally where I think we need to go. I think we're going to get there again. Brief General Henderson, he's like 
we got to get done. Gerald Iams has, has, has been supportive of it. We're just finalizing the staffing uh, to try and get that done. And hopefully it'll be unclass. That's what we drafted it at, drafted it as an unclass doc. So this can get out into hands of battalion commanders, regimental commanders, MWSS, you know, commanders, sergeants, major, and everybody sort of sees uh, and gets excited about where we're going. And then, and and then really helps us uh, uh, give us, gives us feedback across the service uh, to, to give, to give them the best products available. Outstanding. Um, Last one, and then we'll sign off. Uh, do you see yourself continuing to uh, contribute to Marine Corps marksmanship and the CAP after your retirement? Um, y- yeah, I would like to. Um, again, that that's a good question, and and I'm glad you did send that one to me ahead of time because I had to think about it. So, it you know, and and I think in our I don't know how it is in the services, but in the Marine Corps generally, when you reach your change your change of command, you you go away. Right. Because you don't because it's un, it's deemed unprofessional as the outgoing commander coming back and meddling. Again, you, you pass the flag, uh, you pass the colors, uh, the mantle of command is passed to the new guy. And it's generally deemed as a professional thing to let him um, do that. So so I will do that um, as far as civilian jobs. I would I would like it. I, none of those. I'm not at a point uh, that that's materialized yet. But as I thought about this is I think probably the best way that I can help is really how Jack Cuddy, former Webs Training Battalion CO and first OIC of the Scout Sniper Instructor School, along with uh, Carlos Hathcock, and then Steve Walsh, who was the second OIC of the Scout Sniper Instructor School, have helped me out, is that they, they have given me perspective on the history of the organization, right? And, um, and re- right, and, 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 SSIS showed up to Weapons Training Battalion because we had the best marksmen in the service through teams. And again, th- those are the types of things that, I, that I'm talking to Colonel Cuomo about. Um, like the center of gravity of the battalion is teams, and, and we can accomplish a lot of things um, for the service because we, we are the marksmanship center of excellence. We're this little ballistics laboratory with these just freakishly talented marksman and you can throw any marksmanship challenge at them hey we hey you know this is how teammates went down we bought them because they were great and then uh the gunner symposium through the gunner symposium uh, i think in the tcom gunner were like hey the cg needs a tnr task to go with this uh, that was staff and ceos and not even that was germ germ i mean just a smart calm data guy and gunner costa going like this is how the ballistics work here's some math go figure out a way with students from Fort Greg Adams uh, to teach this to the Marine Corps, right? And, and that's consistently, if you understand the history of the battalion, that's how we're able to give back to the service because we just have highly talented shooters that know everything about everything from a marksmanship perspective. And you just throw a challenge to us and we're able, we're able to figure it out. So um, I think the best way, again, that I can help out is to give perspective um, on the history of things, right? And talking to Keith Sanderson and a lot and Chris Wade, um, Jeff Eby, Vince Pope, all of those guys that were battalion gunners to really understand it take like I get I've gotten a lot of positive feedback. You guys gave me feedback, but some of it's been like, how are you getting so much done? We've done the moving target uh table t- whatever table it was might have been table seven we've done this before um and again it keeps you grounded because you know you're not a genius and you don't believe your own hype then we go back to i think how we've been successful is we've just had a lot of general officers that have been supportive of change where that may n- not have i don't want to denigrate any former cg of training commander t i'm not saying they weren't supportive but also, again, we've talked about this in the environment of force design, like it or not, we're challenged to get better. So we have talked about this before. So the sacred cow of marksmanship, like, is also allowed to be challenged, right, because the commandant's challenged a lot of things that we say we're the best at in the world and we can't, we can't be touched. So that's sort of a, a long answer, but it's that perspective that was given to me by previous gunners and previous commanders that certainly, you know, through podcasts like this or the ones that we've done before that hopefully that, that I can contribute to over the, over the long term, um, whether or not I, I find myself involved in, um, 
working in the in the marksmanship world or not, which which I wouldn't mind to any employers out there. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's a great, it's well, a well, great world. Actually, one of one, one of the things I'm gonna do. My son's a police officer, and my my oldest son, my uh, middle son's gonna be a police officer. I've been trying to get them up here just to sh- just to shoot. I taught them how to shoot pistol, which is probably why they're not that good. Um, but but uh, I honestly starting to look back in uh, in the Wilmington area at competitions and talking to my son about going to shoot j- just because that, I mean, that's his lifeblood. And in two years as a police officer, he's already come across, you know, felons with weapons and drugs and people spitting at them because they're, they're meth heads and trying to fight them. So um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's definitely a family, maybe not in the some ways that some of these guys were like every, everyone in their family, brother and sisters when the Marine Corps, but at least, service for me is a family business and then obviously being able to protect yourself is important so i i that's the thing that i'm looking forward to as i retire and move back to north carolina is probably being involved at least locally with my son uh, um, allows me to stay involved at least locally and, and get them involved in it too because again great great people and uh you, you as ken nelson always says you don't you don't i'm not gonna i'll paraphrase him but he basically says something like you you haven't been under pressure uh, or, or known how good you are or are not until you get a timer going off in your ear. And again, I'm paraphrasing, but he is certainly, he's certainly correct. You think you're decent until you're under time pressure is his basic point. So, and he's right. Yeah. And that's something we can all agree with, uh, agreed with what you said about perspective. And that's part of the reason we've really enjoyed having you on this podcast. I think yeah. the perspective you give in terms of all the develop, all the Marine Corps developments in marksmanship, has been, you know, really gratifying conversation for myself and Matt to have uh, over the couple of years that you've been the uh, the Weapons Train Battalion CEO. Uh, at this point, that's all the questions we had for you. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to leave the listeners with? No, I appreciate it. Um, I'm especially appreciative of the fact right before we started that people actually listen, say people actually listen to the podcast, which that's helpful because at the end of the day, that's all, you know, when you start to get senior, that's your, it starts to be your job is to give pass on your experience, um, yeah, pass on your experience, um, pay it for proverbial, pay it forward, help people learn from you. Um, and I think hopefully I've done it in a way that's not arrogant or, or brags on, on, on myself too much. Cause then that, that still that, that, uh, taints the message, but yeah, just, um, again, I think I'll just leave, leave, especially in the time with political strife, and everybody hates General Berger and everybody hates General Smith because we were we're ruining the Marine Corps, even though if you read books about the Marine Corps before World War II, we didn't even have six digits of people and we didn't have division or meth, meth structure. Right. So um, don't lose faith in the country and don't lose faith in the Marine Corps, um, because, because, again, they've just been proven brands um, for for the entire the, the 20th and the 21st century uh tone down tone down the vitriol a little bit better uh, a little bit more and just uh remain semper fidelis yeah yeah I th- very well put um i just want to say colonel jones congratulations on yet another successful tour of command a well-earned retirement best of luck with your future endeavors and i'm sure we're going to have you back on at some point uh catch Uh-oh. up with what you're doing and you know maybe maybe talk about uh you know some matches that you you've attended down there in the okay. wilmington area yeah but- good to go and I know that we'll we'll get Matt we'll get Matt introduced to Colonel Cuomo and see if see if he's interested. I think he's done he's done some podcasts before, so we'll we'll try and carry on the tradition. Yeah, absolutely. We would love to make it a tradition for sure. Uh, to our listeners, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Please let us know how we're doing, and we'll see you on the next one.